message we're going to talk about tonight is called to be holy. And we're going to start out in 1 Peter 2.9. Are you recording this? Okay, 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. One of the things that seems to be the church is really afraid of today is talk about holiness. And this whole gospel message, as we look at this, I, I know it's a difficult word, and also we're going to co cover the word sanctification. And the words that seem very hard to understand, but they're very simple. And since the Bible uses them so much, I don't think we can avoid them. We have to understand what the Bible's talking about, because our whole purpose in life is that we've been called by God to be holy people Some, it, makes it, it really means that we're called apart set apart for his exclusive use and that's what really holiness is all about we're going to see that more as we go through here but this royal priesthood a holy nation a people belonging to God and it all comes back to that we're, going to, we're supposed to be a people belonging to God and that's what we're going to find out what sanctification means Sanctification is simply the process of separating us from the ways of the world so we can be a people that belong to God. Now, as we look at the various scriptures we're going to go through tonight, we're going to find out that there's really some different meanings to holiness and there's some different meanings to sanctification. One of the things we're going to find out in the Old Testament they were called to be holy. But there was no provision in the Old Testament for ever truly having holiness of heart. Only Jesus Christ had the power to really give us that nature. And we can be holy like our Lord is holy. But it's not ever going to be us. When we can say that I no longer live, I've, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, that's the only way you'll ever be holy like the Lord. And we're going to find some scriptures that says we have to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And all I'm saying is that is something we do not do through human effort. There is something we have to do and that, and that comes back to our consecration. There is a consecration. We've got to come out and we're, there's, we're being told not to and touch any unclean thing. But once we've come out and we've just kind of given ourselves up to God, it's up to Him to then make us holy, to make us the kind of holiness that all the world can see. So we're going to see that there is a distinct difference between the Old Testament kind of holiness and what is now made available through the New Testament. Let's, because we're, this verse talked about um, so that we may declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His wonderful light. The whole purpose is that we're supposed to be just overawed with what God has done in our lives. It's His light. I mean, there is only one source of light. The light is this truth of the New Testament, that light is all actually all of His Bible. God hasn't changed from the Old to the New Testament. The only difference between the Old and the New Testament is that in the New Testament, the provision has been made to fulfill all the laws through the life of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, they couldn't ever do it. They, had, they, you know, they tried their best they continued to cry out for a, a Savior, a Messiah that can, would come and save them basically from themselves. In the New Testament, we're supposed to be walking in the light as Jesus walked in the light. And what I'm saying is, is we cannot do that. But I, as we go through, and it's going to be several weeks, I think, as we look through this, it, it, it's 
we have to understand our part of it because obviously the scriptures talk about us having a responsibility in this. But yet it so clearly says that Jesus keeps telling us, you know, apart from me you can do nothing. You can't, you can't do anything. Jesus himself says, I can do nothing. We're going to see that in the scripture tonight. It's, it's not us doing the work of God. It's us preparing ourselves for the filling of the Holy Spirit so he can do his work. Can we kind of get a grasp of that? That we're going to have to do something to prepare ourselves so the Holy Spirit can get a full claim on our life so he can, we're just yielded vessels and he can do what he wants to do and that he's the one that now manifests the life of Jesus Christ through us. It's not us. But what I, what I want to get now, I want to go back to a first John, no, just John 3, 19 and 21. Because in Peter there, again, we've been, we call into the light to, you know, to just give praise to God for what he's done. He's the one that brings us into this light. And this verse in John 3:19 and 21, I'm sorry, it is 3:21. Let's just, no, let's go back to 3:19. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. So we have the contrast between light and darkness. Now, God is light. God produces all light. There is no light other than Him. So whatever light we do have, it's going to come from Him. It's going to come from the Holy Spirit. Okay. And will not come into the light for fear that His deeds will be exposed. So there are going to be people that are afraid to come into the light. And, God, and they're afraid they don't even want to hear about holiness. They don't even want to hear about the true life of Jesus Christ. They're afraid to come into it because it's going to expose so many things in their own lives. Now, since we're called to be holy, we're really called to be exposed to some light that we're not necessarily going to like at times. But I guarantee you, if you're really converted and if you've really... God is really working in your lives, the greatest thing you'll want to do is come into this light. I mean, it'll just, you'll have this pull, this innate desire, I, I have to know more of the Lord. I need to know more of this light. I need to know more of His truth. I, I want to come into the light. Okay. But they're afraid to be exposed by it. But then he says in verse 21, this is what, what the verse I wanted to look at. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Can we see that the only way to really come into the light and, and it's supposed to do something radically to our lives so that everyone can plainly see that God's done the work? I mean, we can go out and be really moral people without Christ. I mean, you can go out and find in your neighborhood some people that are trying to be just really righteous and moral and just upstanding, you know, outstanding citizens. But nobody is really impressed or, or giving all honor and glory to God for the way they're living. That's because it's apparent that they've worked very hard. They've got themselves in a condition that they're, they've put off a lot of the garbage of this world and they're living good lives they might be serving a lot of community services they might be doing a lot of things like that but there's something in God's life in the life of Jesus Christ that we're, we're supposed to receive that it is so plain that everybody can see that it comes from a work of the Holy Spirit in us people are supposed to come and say you know how do you always have that joy in you? How do you... All, I mean, how, where does that come from? How come you're not ever... You know... The, the circumstances of this world are what bring us down. And what I'm saying is there is such a life through Jesus Christ that can lift us above the circumstances of this world and He wants to lift us above the circumstances of this world so that the world will plainly see that what has been done has been done through God. That... No, there's no way you could live like that if it wasn't God doing the work through us. And so they'll come and ask you for the hope that's in you. 
they'll come and ask you, why, how is that possible? How do you live that way? And obviously, once God has done this in your life, you would never come back, well, I did this and I did that. It has nothing to do with us. I mean, all you can do is just thank God for what He's done to you. Okay? But this light is holiness. I, all I want to say is this, you know, we're going to find out that God says, be holy like I'm holy. Holiness is the light. I mean, that pure light is holiness. Pure light is the life of God. And it can be imparted. So just like the sun. The sun is really an example of how God works. That sun is up there, and when it shines, it just radiates down on us. It opens up all kinds of things. You know, if you're out there in the complete dark at nighttime, you can't see hardly anything. But that sun can just shine forth and give us light and help us understand a lot of things, what's going on around in our world right around us. Well, the same way that God used the sun to, you know, give us heat and light and all of these things, He can use the Holy Spirit through the sun, S-O-N, to give us light. To get, you know, just make it, everything so clear and under, you know, it just opens up the ways of God. And He can impart that the same way those rays of that sun come down and can warm us in the daytime. But matter of fact, the Old Testament talks about the day when our sun would no longer go down. There, there would just be a light all the time. And there can be that light in this world. It just depends on how much we have become a vessel of His life. And that, that growing in grace will never end. And our yieldedness will just get greater and greater and greater as we get more sensitive to the Holy, to the Holy Spirit and how He works. But all I'm trying to, trying to do is build up here some hope to help you understand that what God plans to do, He wants to do it in a way that it's plainly seen by everyone that He's the one that's doing it. Now the last scripture here, just open up in First Thessalonians. I'm trying to relate that the light is, is the holiness of God. His light, it's His truth, and we've been called to come into the light. We've been come, called to be holy like He is holy. And obviously we can't do it, but He can do it. Okay, First Thessalonians 4, 7 and 8. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you the Holy Spirit. Now, like I say, there's, there's a lot of people out there who don't want to hear anything about holiness. But you've got to understand, if you reject holiness, you're naturally rejecting God because God is holy. If you reject light, like we read back in John, people don't like to come into the light. But if you reject light, if you reject God's truth because you're afraid of what it's going to expose in you, probably around the corner. Anyway, if, if you reject light, you reject holiness, you, you, you're really rejecting God. This is going to become more clear here because we're going to find out what all the blessings of life come in holiness. The holier we are, and again, that's the more of God's life we have in us, the greater the joy, the greater the peace, the greater the love that will flow out of us. The fruit of the Spirit. I mean, and this, this is agape love. This is that absolute selflessness that comes from God. This is joy in, in you just know that even in the worst of circumstances, God is working something out here. You know, and He can give you complete peace in the middle of, even like I say, and it may, everything may appear, appear to be dark around us, but if you can completely abandon yourself to God and He's brought you into the holiness that the Lord had, that Jesus had when He walked, you just have complete faith that God's going to work this all out. And again, you can't work this out in your mind. I want you to understand this. You cannot... Just get your mind set and I'm just going to just always think of God. No, He's going to have to bring you into this life. 
And you're going to have to yield to it as he strips away things. This has to be something, and it's like Jesus talked about this living water that flows out of heaven. It's got to flow or it's not going to work. So we're going to be looking at, about, looking at how we enter in, I guess, what I could say, over the next few weeks. One, ac- one aspect of holiness refers to being set apart exclusively for God's use. Okay, that, that is the basic essence of what our understanding of holiness has to be right now. We have to understand that we've been... To be holy is to be set apart exclusively for His use. Do we understand that? Not simply to do His works, but that will flow out of us because we're, we've been set apart to be a vessel of His life. We're supposed to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit... Now that Jesus is, you know, Jesus walked in a mortal body, he no longer has a mortal body, but he came and lived through Jesus in a mortal body to show us what the life of God was like. Now we've been called to do the same thing, to walk as Jesus did. Now, obviously, we can't do that in our our own strength. So when he says we've been created to be vessels or temples of the life of God, that is going to have to be from the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit needs somebody to use. He needs to have a, a body that he can enter into and continue to live and show us what Jesus is like, and not just us, but the world, what Jesus is like. And the, power, the Holy Spirit has that power to come into us, and he needs a body. Otherwise, he's a spirit out there, and he's working. I guarantee you he's working. But how can God be seen the most plainly, like we saw back there in John, that is plainly seen that what has been done has been done through God? How can that most plainly be seen? When the Holy Spirit gets a full grip of our life and He can live and He can just control us and direct us and empower us to live the same way He empowered Jesus to once live. That's what holiness, that's why we're called apart to be holy so that we're abandoned to God for His use. That's the whole essence of holiness. And what I'm saying is, once while the separating is an Old Testament thought of us being called apart for God's exclusive use, the true holiness, the true life of God, is something the Holy Spirit has to come in and fill us with. It's not our, it's not our work to, to walk in holiness. It's our work to help in the separation process to yield to the Holy Spirit and come out but I guarantee you God has the power to then fill us okay now sanctification is the actual process of being separated it's an act or a process of being separated from the ways of the world for the purpose of becoming God's property or possession so what is sanctification? it's just a matter of that natural work of the Holy Spirit, the convicting work, as He draws us ever closer to God, that's what sanctification, it's not a difficult word, it just means that we're coming closer and closer to God all the time, getting more and more of the life of God in us. And all I'm saying is, the Bible, all through the Old Testament, it talks about sanctification. It talks about, and those were only pictures, they were only trying to show us in the physical realm, what's really supposed to happen in the spiritual realm. When certain instruments for the temple, they had to be sanctified before they were ever put into use. So there was a whole mess of things that they did to prepare those instruments, to prepare the temple, to prepare the priests. Everything had to be prepared before it could become God's exclusive property for His use. You couldn't just use the profane. You couldn't just take somebody off the street he had to be separated. And what he's trying to tell us at that, you're asking the question, you know, many say, Lord, Lord, and do not do the will of the Father in heaven. And there's going to be many up there who's going to say that we did all these things in, you know, in the Lord's name while we were here. But he's going to say, away from me, you know, evildoers. I never, you know, I never knew you. So, yes, and that was your question. Is everybody saved? Well, from the moment you look to the blood of Jesus, you're saved. From the moment that the thief on the cross 
relied and depended upon Jesus as a Savior, he was saved. But I have to say that if that thief on the cross was permitted to come down off that cross that day, he would expect he would have been expected to follow Jesus. What I, you know, see what I'm saying? While if let's say you're you're an old person and you're in a plane crash and you, I'm not saying you don't have the opportunity or you will. It's only the Spirit is ever going to lead you to it in the first place. But we cannot cling to one-time professions if we're not going to be led by the Spirit. And if you've really made the true confession that God looks at in our heart, what I'm saying is He'll give you a regenerate heart. And a regenerate heart hungers and thirsts after righteousness. That's a blessing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they will be filled. But the first is to come up and have the blessing of having a hunger and thirst. And I guarantee you, if you've really, truly submitted yourself to the Lord and said that sinner's prayer with a true heartfelt meaning, you're going to be wanting to know because God's just going to put, He's going to do something to your heart that causes you to want to know more and more and more. Go ahead, Frank. What's the difference between when the body is Well, okay. How could I tell people? How could I tell people? Well, first, of, well, first of all, when you start, like I say, as, if you really have confessed your sins and you've turned yourself over to the Lord, and only the, see what I'm saying, God looks at the heart. We can fool ourselves. We can deceive ourselves. And what I'm saying is, if you're never blessed, if, if you know it goes on week after week and there seems to be no blessing, I have no hunger to be like Jesus. I have no desire to even follow after Him. I'm, I've got a question whether regeneration has ever took and taken place. In the old, in, all through for centuries and centuries, up to the last few years, they really looked for regeneration in people's lives before they'd even allow them, you know, to become church members. There was a real spiritual regeneration had to take place. And all I'm saying is that's just the desire to come after the Lord. And that is what regeneration does. God does something to your heart does something to your inner being, your soul, that causes you to want to seek after the Lord. But all I'm saying is that initial seeking off after the Lord, because you're so full of self-sufficiency, you're going to be stumbling all the time. God has to break your self-sufficiency now. <coughs> so, yes, the flesh is going to rise up. You're going to constantly wander back to the world. You're going to be going back and forth, back and forth. You're going to, you know, the Spirit is going to be saying, you know, you need to be doing this. The flesh is going to be yanking you back the other direction. And that's not exactly an undivided heart. That is really a divided heart. It's going back and forth, back and forth. We see that in Romans 7 constantly. You know, you know what you want to do, but you can't do it. And all I'm saying is in Ezekiel 36, we'll look at that. God promises to give us an undivided heart. He promises to establish His undivided kingdom in us. And if He does that, you're only... There's no more pulling back to the world. There's such a thing as being as overcoming the world. There's a, God can do that. The world has no more pull on you. These things of this world, you, there's nothing here that has any desire anymore because of the presence of the Lord in your soul completely satisfies it. This, all I'm saying is you'll always want more of the Lord, but there's so much satisfaction in the Lord that this world has no more grip on you. And that's why the circumstances of this world can be overcome. Because the living water of Jesus Christ's life flowing through you can lift you up in every kind of circumstance. And, I mean, He just holds you to the Lord. He holds you in the presence of the Lord. He can do that. But He has to do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to look at... We're going to have to look through these scriptures now. I'm going to look at some Old Testament scriptures about holiness. All I'm saying... Those two aspects, you know... Holiness is a matter of being set apart for God's use. Sanctification is the process of being set apart. Okay? We've been called to be holy, but we have to be sanctified. We have to be pulled. We have to be, you know, drawn by the Holy Spirit into this holiness of life. And that's the work of sanctification. Separating us evermore for, the, for God's possession. Okay, Leviticus. Okay, 
Okay, verse 7. Leviticus 20, verse 7 and 8. Consecrate yourselves. That's our work. We're going to find out what consecration is. And be holy. Because I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. There, there are several aspects of this we have to understand. First of all, we've been told to consecrate ourselves and we're going to look at that more closely as we go along. That's the offering up of ourselves to God. We have to offer ourselves. Even from the very beginning, we have to offer ourselves to God. Go ahead, Roger. Uh, my Bible, the New King James Version, right. see, it so, says, uh, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Right. The same thing as holiness. But, okay, that's good. That's good. What, what did we just talk about? Sanctifying, it, He's the one that's separating us. He's the one that makes us holy. Let's put it this way. Holiness is over here. Holiness is God. Okay? We're over here. Can, can you understand that now? Yeah. Holiness is over here. God is holy. God's the only one really holy. We cannot be holy other than entering into the presence of the Lord. God's life in us makes us holy. Now we're over here and He says, Be holy like I'm holy. Now how do you get over here and to get into His holiness? Through the work of sanctification. The Holy Spirit is drawing us. And that's why he says, I am the one that sanctifies you. I am the one that makes you holy, gets you over here. Do you understand that? So the word is the same. Actually, the word saint, sanctify, and holy all have the same root. They all mean basically the same thing. You know, they all have the same root. So, to be a saint means to be holy. And to sanctify is to bring us over into this life of holiness. It's the Holy Spirit that draws us over here. So now, like I say, there's only one holiness, and that's in God. We cannot create holiness. We've been called to be holy. You know, so we sit here and we consecrate ourselves and we give ourselves up to the, be led by the Holy Spirit. And then he says, I am the one who makes you holy or sanctifies you, brings you over here and causes you to be holy. Do you understand that? So... The word is the same, but all I'm saying is in the life of holiness is in the life of the presence of the Lord and that's where, that's where all the light comes from. That's where all the life comes from. So, He is the one who draws us to Him. He says, keep my decrees and follow them. That means we're going to have to respond to Him. If you're, if you're, going, if you're never going to be sanctified if, you don't, if you're unwilling to keep His decrees. If you're unwilling to read the Bible, if you're unwilling to let the Spirit work through your heart, as you read and you respond, that's what He's doing. He's sanctifying you. He's separating you. He's bringing you over to this life of holiness. And He is the one that sanctifies you, that makes you holy. Let's just jump down to verse 26. You are to be holy to Me because I, the Lord, am holy. And I have set you apart from the nations to be My own. Again, that's the same statement that He's setting us apart. He's drawing us and we're going to be exclusively God's property. That's all. That is the meaning of redemption. He redeems us. We've somehow got this thing that God redeems us just to forgive us for our sins and to go to heaven someday. But it's more than that. He has to forgive us our sins so that He can then begin to sanctify us. So forgiveness of sin is critical and it's a very first element of this whole redemption process. But it's the only beginning. We can't just stop because our sins are forgiven. We've been called to manifest the life of Jesus Christ. And He's the only one that's holy that can put this holiness into us. So that means we've got to begin responding to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit as He leads us out from the ways of the world into the presence of the Lord, into that inner veil, in, you know, so His holy life can be manifest through us. Then, God's glory can be seen and people can begin to see that what has been done has plainly been done through His work and His power. So, all I'm saying is we can't stop at just forgiveness of sins. We've been called to live a holy life and only God can be holy. And so when we become holy to God and, and, and nothing else can touch us in this world, we've overcome the world and this, God's got such a grip on our lives 
it'll be plainly seen that only God could have done that. I, I guarantee you, nobody will say, how did you work that out in your own strength? They want to know, how did this all come about? And you can tell them about the Holy Spirit. And you can tell them about how Jesus comes to sanctify people. He is a sanctification. Okay, let's go to Psalms. That may help a little more here. Uh, Psalms 24. to six. Now the same picture now is only God's up on a hill. That's where His holy hill is. This is Mount Zion. God's presence. But He says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Okay. While here again, I, I was picturing us over here and God over here in the sanctification process as us being drawn into God's presence. But now we've got God up here on a hill. Let's just call it we're going uphill now to enter into His presence. As you read the Old Testament, you'll find constantly finding the teachings about Zion. Zion is God's presence. It's in God's presence. And He wants us to live in Zion, that holy city. And in Hebrews it talks about, you know, New Testament Christians now have the opportunity to enter into that holy city, to enter into the presence of the Lord, to enter into His holiness. And all I'm saying is, God is the one that really has to do this. We are drawn up. But who gets to go there? He says, those with the clean hands. We're going to look at that a little closer later on. But what, he's, what, he's, what we're going to find out that he says, come out from them and touch no unclean thing. We're going to read that in Second Corinthians. He's talking about our heart idols. Our heart is filled with idols we depend on. You know, all these things that we... We're, we're, we're empty. We're, we're bored. <laughs> nothing's going on let's go find something to have fun all I'm saying is if Christ was filling your life you wouldn't have to turn to the world to find your source of fulfillment anymore and so to come into his presence and to come into all the fullness of God's life that he promises and all the way through Ephesians if you read that you know being filled with all the fullness of God or being becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, this fullness of life that we can, that our body can be filled with. And I want to distinguish between being filled with all the fullness of God. It's like, like I, I said before, it's the, you got the ocean out there and you take a vessel and you put it on the ocean. Now, there's no way that you can fill that vessel up with all of the ocean, but you could submerge that vessel into the ocean and that vessel can, can be completely sub, you know, submersed in the ocean. And we can be sub, completely submersed in the life of God. We can't, we'll never have the infinite God in us, I can assure you. We're going to have very limited light down in this world compared to what God has. But all I'm saying is our, the vessel of our life can be completely submerged and submersed in that, that baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. It complete immersion into the life of, of God. It can be. But who can come into that presence? Who can do that? It's, it, we cannot have heart idols. That's, this is our only function in this whole process. Be willing to put off your heart idols. That's all he's asking. And even then, the Holy Spirit will enable us. Because we're going to have to, you know, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So, even then, we have to cry out to the Lord and pray and, and seek His help in putting off these heart idols. But we have to ask Him to examine us, show us the heart idols, show those things that I've been dependent on. And I can get it all the way down to its lowest level. It's self-trust. 
Everything that we trust in, I mean, in ourselves, in this world, everything that we trust in this world automatically takes us away from trusting God. He wants us to totally trust in Him for all things. And when that's what holiness is. He's going to draw us back to that holiness of life where our only trust is in Him. So, we got to keep examining ourselves. What am I trusting in? Am I trusting in this or that? And am I trying to use this thing to fill me? Or am I trying to use that thing? Am I, I'm bored here. I need to do this. Well, I, I guarantee you, if you'll be willing to put those things off, God will fill the temple of our life, submerge us just in the depths of His life. And, and you will, you'll find that you overcome the world and you have no desire for those things. I'm not saying you won't go along and enjoy the, this world. I mean, this world is created in beauty. But no longer do you need the things of this world. There's this difference. Paul says, you know, he was... Uh, there was just nothing in this world. All things were... He was free for, to, to do all things. And why was that? Because there wasn't anything in this world that he could care one way or another, whether I have it or don't have it. I mean, he didn't care if he had food or didn't have food almost. He says, I found contentment in all things, whether I was well-fed or hungry, whether I was in a prison or not. That's because the presence of the Lord was with him. And, that's, and he says that's the secret, basically. But as we look at this, and, and I, I, you know, the life is offered to us, and we ask, why am I not in it? Why haven't I not entered into the fullness of life? We've always got it. There's only one thing. It's, he's not asking us to get rid of our anger. He's not asking us... I mean, he says you can't have it, but you can't do that. What I'm saying is, those things are what Christ will purge out with his new life. We're, we're so caught up in trying to get rid of this sin and this sin and this sin and this sin. What he's asking us to do is to come out from them, touch no unclean thing. Get rid of your heart idols. You put off the things that you've been using. Let Him produce the life of holiness in you. When you're abandoned and you're just absolutely helpless and you, you have no hope in anything in this world anymore and that your only hope is in God and you're just on your knees just crying out for God for the filling of the Holy Spirit, that is when you're in a condition. You've lost all hope in everything in this world. God has brought basically to an end all of your hope in this world. And then he's in a, you're in a condition for the Lord to come down and fill you in fullness and produce the new nature. The new nature comes from Jesus Christ. If you're going to try to be like Jesus, and you're going, to, you're going to live in a frustrated life. Oh, it's going to be frustrating. Because you don't have it. You don't have the strength. All he's asking us is to come out from him. Don't, don't swear by false things. Okay. He will re- the person that does that will receive the blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. That, that vindication, you've got to understand, because that's another thing that's going to come up in this process. You're going to be persecuted and you're going to be expected, you're going to think, I've got to be defending myself and all this. When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't defend himself. When we go to the cross, we cannot be defending ourselves. People are going to be persecuting us, telling you're ridiculous for what you're doing, you're radical, you're, you've gone berserk, you, you know, you need to, mental help, whatever. They're going to tell you these things and you shouldn't be defending yourself. The vindication will come from the Lord when the day he fills you with the Holy Spirit in a way that just lifts you above anything that these guys ever talk to you about. You know, they, they've uh, telling you, oh yeah, maybe counseling, maybe this, maybe that. You need to do this to find your happiness. All I'm saying is the Lord one day will vindicate you. That's what we have to seek. The vindication and the blessing of the Lord. Okay, such is the generation of those who seek Him. Who seek your face. And that, that's that spiritual image. The face, when He talks about the seek the face of the Lord, it's the... Basically, it's a spiritual representation for speak, seeking out the spiritual image of the Lord. That's what He's called us to do, to seek out His spiritual image. Okay, let's uh, go to Ezekiel. i got two quick ones in there. we got to move right along. Ezekiel 20. I'm just going to kind of read these, both these scriptures because I don't want to dwell on them too long. And you may, you may want to go back and look at them. Ezekiel 20, 39 to 42. He says, 
As for you, O house of Israel, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Go and serve your idols, every one of you. You know, that, this is what kind of makes God angry. He says, go ahead and go try your idols. Because, I mean, I want you to try them. Because if you don't try them, you're never going to realize that they don't work. That's why he always sent them off into bondage. He says, you go try this. Try to see if these idols work. But afterward, you will surely listen to me and no longer pro- profane my holy name with your gifts and idols. What I'm saying is, he'll let us try our idols. He'll let us try our drinking, our drugs, our, you know, our houses, our careers. He'll let us try all of these things to find happiness. See if they work, he says. They will not work. There's, it's a broken cistern that just keeps running dry. For on my holy mountain, the high mountain of Israel, declares the sovereign Lord, there in the land, the entire house of Israel will serve me. And there I will accept him. You know, he's calling us into the house of Israel. That's God's, Israel, it's God's called out people. It's, you know, the people of God. We've been called out in that holy land. And he says, there is where we'll serve him. There he gives us an undivided heart. There we want to serve nobody other than God. There I will require your offerings and your choice gifts, along with all your holy sacrifices. I will accept you as fragrant incense when I bring you out from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered and I will show myself holy among you in the sight of the nations so he's going to show himself holy through us we're going to see that in another scripture he wants to show us in the sight of all the nations so that they'll know that we are people of God a holy nation that first scripture we read in first Peter you're a holy nation that people called out and he wants to show ourselves holy then you will know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel. So in the land of Israel, I mean into the promised land, into the Sabbath rest of God is where he's bringing us. That's where the holiness of life is. That's where the undivided kingdom is. And in that land where he plans to bring us, that's where the fragrance is. It's a land of milk and honey he talks about. And let's go to Ezekiel 36. Just over to chapter 36 real quick. Thirty-six. Twenty-three. Twenty-two. Let me read from. Therefore, say, say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am going to do these things but for the sake of my holy name. I mean, he's the one that's supposed to get all the glory and he's going to make us holy for his purposes. You think he doesn't want us to be holy? He wants us to be holy more than we do, I can guarantee you. And so he has this great desire to do that for his holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I show myself holy through you before their eyes and I sanctify myself through you. But what I'm saying is, when God makes us holy like He is holy, then the nations will know that He is God. That's what that verse back in in John uh, 3.21 said. That it will be plainly seen that what has been done has been done through God. What he's saying is when he sanctifies himself through us, he's setting his own self apart from all others. Well, basically, he, he is set apart. God is he is the he is the set apart one. He he's set, setting us apart from all others, okay. and so he can then fill his. See, he is set apart. I'm saying he sits up in this holy mountain. He's a set apart God. He's completely different than all of us. He's calling us and sanctifying us and bringing us to him, so he can make us a vessel of his life. We're a sanctified, set-apart life that He fills us with His life. It is a holy life. It's not something we do. It's something He puts in us. So, yes, He calls us and separates us and He gives us His holy nature in us so that we can live that way naturally without fighting it and struggling with it. We just naturally love to live in holiness. All of our joy comes from it. Right. Well, we're drawn. 
We ha- like all I'm saying is the sanctifying process. We're drawn. We put off our heart idols. That's our one restriction. Our, our one our goal. Our one objective, I guess, is to put off our heart idols. To seek to know other thing. To get rid of self trust. To be totally dependent upon Him, and then He makes us holy. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries, and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your heart idols, basically all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That's what he wants to do, just to have us, our only desire is to keep his laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. All that unrighteousness. He, he, he's going to do this. I think I better turn this over. All I'm trying to do is put across now that we've, called to, we've been called to be holy. It's been in the, all through the Old Testament. God's people have called to be holy. The problem is with the Old Testament, the corrupt heart. There was no provision. They could never be holy. Like God is holy. Now they were called to it and all through the Old Testament. You, you just read about the struggling hearts of these prophets that just wanted to be holy that couldn't be holy. Oh, they struggled. And oh, they wanted to be holy. The, the Spirit was with them. The Spirit was guiding them and directing them. But they couldn't get a holy heart because Christ hadn't done His work. He hadn't, he hadn't died. He hadn't been raised from the dead. He hadn't been glorified. So the Holy Spirit, He couldn't communicate His holy life back into the hearts of man. So, we're going to look at this now, the difference between the Old Testament, and we, that's why we can never compare ourselves with the Old Testament, ne- truly. Because what He says, He says John the Baptist was the greatest of all the Old Pro- Testament prophets. I guess He lived as holy as any man could possibly live. John the Baptist. He was the greatest of all of them. But, he says, everyone who enters the kingdom of God will be greater than that in holiness. The holiness of life. I'm not saying we'll do what we'll do. He can make you a holy life and just leave you as a housewife raising kids. But I'm saying your holiness of life can be greater than John the Baptist was and every prophet of the Old Testament. That natural inclination to live just for the Lord, just, you know, to be filled with His life can be in the kingdom of God and that can be established in our heart is something that they could never do and that's all I'm saying we're going to look at now at the provision I want to first of all define sin sin because it has its root in unholiness now this is the there's all kinds of sins that come out of this but the sin begins one is unbelief We put our trust in someone or something other than God. I mean, there's three basic things here that would take care of all of our sins if we would just get rid of them. It's our unbelief. We, if we'd stop trusting in other people, in other things, in whatever, if we put all of our trust in God, that's the first step. The other one is our egocentricity. We, we try to elevate ourselves. In self-trust. Again, it comes back. We, 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 in our own trust, we think that we can work these things out. We come to be, and we also come, become the God of our own life. You know, I'm gonna, I know what I want to do and what I, you know, what's best for me. So we've got to, you know, first of all, we've got to get rid of our unbelief. All of our trust got to go back to God. It all comes back to just a basic element. And then we live for our self-gratification. Basically, what I'm saying, this whole self-life, if we would just give up our unbelief, which you can't do, you're going to have to ask God to help you with that. But you've got to understand, it's our unbelief that causes us to seek to find fulfillment, to seek to find help in every situation from other things and other people. God said, I will work out all things for your good. That's an absolute promise. If we've been called according to His purpose. What's His purpose? 
holiness. I mean, if we've been called according to his purpose to be conformed to the likeness of the Son, we'll look at that. That's uh, Romans 8, 28 and 29. We've been called according to his purpose. He said, I will work out all things for your good. So, why are we trusting in ourselves? That's because of unbelief. It, just, it comes back to unbelief. Because just remember that if we would give up that, if we would recognize that everything we trust in other than God is unbelief, if we get back to this completely abandoning ourselves to God, I guarantee you He'd come and fill us with His life and the rest of it would be easy. The, the walking in the Spirit is, 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 is something that He'd make natural to us. He says, I'll cause you to walk in my ways. I'll just do it. It'll just put a new... I'll put it this... I'll write them on your heart. You don't have to memorize Scripture when Christ writes His nature on our heart. It becomes natural. So, all I'm saying is this sin, all those definitions are basically taking us are the opposite of holiness. Holiness looks totally to God for everything. God is our only answer. We're called to be holy, but we're called to be... Everything is in Him. But holiness. It, yeah, set apart, holy for His use, but at, at the same time, totally dependent upon Him. He is our only hope for everything. And sin is all of our self-trust. That's what happened when Adam and Eve ate from that tree of good and evil, that tree of knowledge. They stopped trusting in God and they began trusting in themselves. And that self-trust means when you're living by self-trust, you cannot live in the garden of pleasure, the garden of Eden. If you want to live in this garden of pleasure, have that garden of pleasure in your soul, the only way back in is to go back to complete trust in God. That's why it's all by faith. It's all by belief. Believing that He can draw us back into that. Okay. Jesus came to show us what it means to live in the, in the spiritual image of God as Adam and Eve originally lived. lived. Not because they had the strength to do it, because they com- when they first lived, they had complete trust in God. So God imparted His life to them. He gave them their image. His image. Now the same thing with Jesus. Jesus came back to show us what went wrong. And it, what did He do? He lived, how did He live? In complete trust. All of His life, He lived in complete... This, an immortal body was dependence on the Father. He came to show us how Adam and Eve should have lived and because he lived that way, God the Father imparted the spiritual image to him. Because he had emptied himself of his own glory. He, he, didn't, he wasn't using his own strength. He could have, but he chose not to. He chose to live as a man and depend on the Father to give him life and all the works through the power of the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean to be holy? Just depend on the Father all the time. Just, I mean... We're called back to a life of just depending on God. And He'll work out the rest. Okay, let's look at uh, Romans 3. We're going to look at the... I was going to, we're talking about the provision that they didn't have in the Old Testament, but now we have in the New Testament. <clears throat> Romans 3.21 uh, He's talking about righteousness now, but actually we, I should have read Ephesians 4.24. I just would, I'll read it to you real quick. Not, you know, we're told to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what it says. Ephesians 4.24 Now, the righteous, Christ is our righteousness. He's our holiness. He's our sanctification. He's everything. So, how would you, anybody ever put on righteousness and holiness? He's going to have to be filled with the life of Jesus Christ. And that's a work of the Holy Spirit. So, now that I'm back at this... Verse 321. But now a righteousness, and you may say a holiness, from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. So we've seen in the Old Testament how 
we were supposed to live in righteousness, we were supposed to live holiness, we were supposed to manifest the life of God, but we couldn't do it. It was impossible. Now, it's been made known in the New Testament apart from the law, apart from human effort, apart from us reading it and trying to do it in our own strength. A new way. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So, how are we ever going to be filled with this life that God wants us to live? According to your faith, it will be done to you. Faith also implies coming out. Faith implies being willing to put off a heart idol so I can be filled with the fullness of God. It, it, there's, God says, do that and I'll do this. Faith would tell me it's worthwhile. Faith, you know, if God's promising to give me a joy that nobody can take away, if He's telling, promising to give me a peace that just transcends all understanding and this world cannot disturb, if He's promising to give me a love that you, you can just empty myself into other people's lives without ever worrying about myself, if He's promised to do that because it's myself that causes all of my tension and my friction and my problems, all of our burdens come from that self-life. And if God can get rid of that with that agape love that just is diametrically opposed to that self-life, if He can just give us that life as a river of living water, is it not worthwhile putting off these heart idols that I've been relying on that didn't ever work? That's why He says, I'm going to put you back out into the nations. I'm going to let you go, go use your idols. Go try them. But they don't work. Now, if I have faith in God and He's made all these promises, and that's why we sit in these Bible classes, because if you're not built up in the faith, you've got to be thoroughly convinced that God can do this or you're not going to do it. I mean, nobody's going to put off all their idols until they're thoroughly convinced that God can do what He's promised to do. And so we go through these classes week after week and we try to build you up in the faith. I try to give you hope that these are the very promises that God has revealed in this New Testament. Well, that God can work out if they're willing to listen. Okay. It's coming by faith. Let's look at these other scriptures real fast. Verse, chapter 5. Same, same of them in Romans. And again, we've looked at this a lot of times. I just want to say it one more time. 5.10. The difference here between being reconciled and saved with the life of Christ. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son. How much more? Having been reconciled, that is, having already been forgiven through His shed blood, having already been forgiven because we trusted in the Lord. We're in Romans 5.10, Roger. Having already that having taken place, you know, it's how much more shall we be saved through His life? It's basically how the holiness of His life has to enter into us. The, the true salvation of the Lord is His life coming down into our inner being and saving us from ourselves, save, saving us from our self-life. Salvation is not just forgiveness of sin. That, that happened through the reconciliation and the shedding of the blood and being forgiven. But how much more is, is this redemption that He gives to us through imparting His very life to us? That's what's going to really save us from all the mess we're in in this world. Okay, down in verse 17 now. Same chapter. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, Adam, if, it, if, if death reigned through that old Adam, and that's that spiritual death we have, that just emptiness, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of this gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So, how much more so this is the provision the Old Testament didn't have. The provision to receive this abundant provision of grace that can impart the very life of holiness and righteousness of Jesus Christ into our soul to enable us to reign in life day after day after day. Nothing can touch our soul. The Holy Spirit has the power to lift us above the circumstances of this world. And so, only holiness... <laughs> people say, ah, oh, holiness, that sounds like such a burden. Such a burden to live in holiness. Oh, you know, you've got to be a grim. That must be grim. You know? <laughs> All I'm saying is, if you want to find the blessings of life, you enter into the holiness of God's presence. Let His holy life dwell, you know, indwell you. 
And I guarantee you, holiness is the greatest thing that will ever happen. That's the life of heaven. Everybody's holy in heaven. Everyone is in their glorified bodies and just got this holiness in them from the life of God that just gives them the greatest joy that could ever be. And we're supposed to get the first fruits of that on the day of Pentecost, our own little Pentecost. Okay, Romans 8. This, this what do you mean our own little Pentecost? We're supposed to have the, the same thing that happened on the day of Pentecost. Jesus came back and showed himself to those first disciples. He talked with them for years, three years, and he talked and taught him everything they needed to know, but it couldn't get the nature inside of them. He says, wait for me. And he came back and he, lived and he dwelt them on the day of Pentecost. And so we need that same thing to happen to us. It's the feast of first fruits. And we need that in our soul. But anyway, 8-2. We just, this is kind of a continuation, you know, how are we going to do this, this gift of abundance through Christ Jesus? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life, it's the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For the, what the law was powerless to do in the Old Testament, they couldn't ever get set free. Because, to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. A sinful nature just wouldn't allow him to get free of it. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering, to cancel that out so that we could enter into his life. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. I mean, all those laws can be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. So, we're going to have to understand the only way into this life is to give up trying to live by human effort. Because when we live by human effort, nothing but a carnal nature can flow out of that. That's all I guarantee you. When you're trying to be righteousness, and you're righteous in your own strength, pride will wreak. You're going to find yourself getting upset about everything and everybody that's interfering with you. The only way to enter into the holiness of the Lord is to just... we got this taking up this cross. It's dying to self. And that even the Holy Spirit have to work that out. But when you're no longer living, if you can say with Paul, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, you know, you have nothing to defend. And you just... All of your dependence is upon the Holy Spirit living His life through you. And that's what it means to live by the Holy Spirit. And that's how your only way that these righteous requirements are ever going to be fully met in you it's when you've given yourself up wholly to the Holy Spirit. That's entirely to the Holy Spirit. To live under His control and power. It's our only answer. So, if you want to know how to enter in, quit touching the heart idols. Come out from them. Let me look at it just a couple more. And we're going to close for tonight and we'll pick up next week. I'm going to look at Colossians just to show you that it's possible. I mean, I, I, we try, we're still looking at provisions, I guess. Colossians 2. It says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. So, if we look at Jesus... All the fullness of the Father lived in, all the fullness of the Father's life lived in bodily form. That doesn't mean that the, and that this is coming back to that ocean explanation again, that all of God's infinite in a glorified body was in this mortal body of Jesus. No. As far as what the fullness of holiness is, what the fullness of 
what does what does God's life look like? It was fully displayed in Jesus Christ. You look at Jesus Christ, you'll find what love, what God's love is like. You, you, you know, you, you'll just find that self-emptying that wants to just reach out and, and and reach lost and hurting people of the world. And all I'm saying is that fullness of life was in Christ, and we have given, been given access to the same fullness of life through Christ by the same power of the Holy Spirit. But in verse 11 it says, In Him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but the circumcision done by Christ. That's what a lot of us are missing. That true circumcision of the heart. That cutting off of the sinful nature. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Acts 15, 8 and 9 says, God purified their hearts and it was by faith. The Holy Spirit came back and cut off that sinful nature. And all it is is that willful nature. He didn't, that didn't mean they never, sin, they never sinned after that. That doesn't mean they never were outside of light. Because light is infinite. And God is always adding light. And you're going to find that you're outside of light. But all I'm saying is He cut off the sinful nature, the willful nature. He put them in a state of complete trust in the Father. They were willing to die then. They had no problem. They, you know... What I'm saying is from then on they would be able to be led by the Holy Spirit. That was their only will to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because God did something to them. He came back and manifested His life in them in a way that enabled them to walk as Jesus did. He says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to show you myself. And I'm going to be inside of you and I'm going to make this walk natural to you. But that was the circumcision of the heart. And all I'm saying is that true circumcision of the heart with a sinful nature, the willful nature is cut off. Most of us have not had that. And all I'm saying is, that's what we need to seek. Aren't you tired of your willfulness? I mean, the willfulness is what causes all of the problems. God can cut it off. That you just just rest in the Lord, you enter the Sabbath rest, and you just let Him do His work. You know it's His work, it's not our work. You mean my foot hurts for stamping it, for not getting my own way? That's what what He's got to cut off, huh? Because it's frustrating. And doesn't all of your anger and your... Your, you know, your sorrow and everything comes from that. that. That rising up and wanting to have our way, our willfulness. Well, if, if God could just get rid of that, and He can, that's the promise of the New Testament, to cut off the willfulness. Jesus didn't have willfulness in Him. And that's what He... If He can cut that off and get us only yielded to His Holy Spirit, then He can fill us with a life that's just beyond comprehension. But as long as our willfulness is there, and as long as we're unwilling to give that up, he can't do it. He got, he, that's why he's got to keep allowing all these circumstances to come into our life to break us of all hope of human effort. He can't do it in human effort. So if you want to know why all of these things keep coming in you, into your life and causing you to fall and trip and stumble, it's because you t- still have self-trust. You're still trying to work this out in your own strength. When that is all gone, when you just got to abandon yourself to God, then he can really take control. And how do you get God's power perfected in you? In weakness, right? In absolute weakness. That's what Paul learned in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He talks about, you know, I found out God's grace was sufficient. This, remember we just read about this grace, this gr- abundant provision of grace that enables us to basically be filled with the life of Jesus Christ? That abundant provision of grace is sufficient for us. We don't have to do anything in our own strength. He's come to do it. But he cannot, you cannot perfect that power in us until we're absolutely weak in self. We've given up all hope in self-directed, self-willed, you know, self-sufficient. You know, all of these self things. We just It's going to be you, Lord. It's got to be you. It's not going to work. When you get to that condition, He can really begin working through you. That's how you get God's power perfected in you. The last scripture we're going to do tonight. First Peter. and 16. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. 
For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Now the question is, that's a clear teaching of the, of the, God, the Word of God. Are we going to be rebels against God? Are we going to refuse to obey His Word? I mean, can we neglect holiness? It doesn't leave us any option. Can we understand that? I mean, holiness is not an option. Holiness is the life of God in the soul. Holiness is the light that He wants to put into us to reflect His nature in this world. And we'll never walk in the light as Jesus is in the light until we allow Him to draw us out from the world to sanctify us wholly, completely, entirely. That's, a, that's another thing that we'll look at next time. It's, there is such a thing as entire sanctification. That means we're separated entirely to God. We have no other desire to be any place except for in the will of God. And He can sanctify us what He refers to through and through or wholly or entirely. He can do that. And then you're over in His holiness and you're living in His presence and it comes from Him. Did you have a question, Roger? Um, no, I just had a comment that said in this Bible, not, you know, it says uh, in your conduct. conduct. In all your conduct? Yeah. So I guess that, that goes hand in hand with all you do. Right. True. In your nature. Our conduct. What are we, what are we doing? Read it. Well, be holy. I'm holy. Mm-hmm. In all your conduct. But hold on. Now you're missing my. What have I talked about all night? You cannot be holy. You, what I'm saying is that that is absolutely true. I mean, oh, let's go over this again one more time. <laughs> what I'm saying is. What I'm doing is holding up something here in this gospel message, a promise of God that He will make you holy. But in the midst of that holiness is all the fullness of life. You know, there's just tremendous fullness in the life of Jesus Christ. And He's holding that up for us. And if you want fullness of life that just makes this world seem like nothing to you so that holiness will be a natural walk, yes, He's calling us to come out and quit touching some things that we've been depending on. But actually, it all can be simplified in a simple statement that when we have no more trust in anything other than God, that's a simple thing. I mean, it's not simple to get there, but it's a simple definition. That's what we've got to keep looking. Do I have trust in something else? Am I trusting somebody else? Am I, you know, do I have self-trust or self-trust in something else? In all my walks of life, maybe a pension. I mean, we look at a simple thing as a pension. I'm not saying God won't give you a pension. But sometimes we won't take a job unless the right pension is there, unless the right medical benefits are there. What I'm saying is be careful or you you begin trusting in something other than the will of God. God wants you to do something and you're trying to make plans around these other things because you're actually going to trust in those things. And until you have given up trusting in everything, I'm telling you everything except for God, God's going to work it out He'll give you what needs to be given to you to make sure everything's taken care of all through your life if you just put your trust in Him. So what I'm saying is if you want to be filled with the life of holiness, your only objective if you choose to take this assignment, (laughs) is to quit trusting in everything except for God. No, all I'm saying is just think of that. Just... Always be examining, what am I trusting in? Am I, trusting, am I trying to work this out in my own strength? And I'm not saying God won't have you always going forward and seeing if doors open and see if they don't open. He's going to be checking. You've got to be testing. You've got to be opening them when, when, when God is telling you to go these directions. But you've got to constantly listen to the Spirit. But what I'm saying is, is the trust. What are you trusting in? And that's all He's asking you. That's the bottom line of this. Go back to a complete trust in God and then... He will bring about the holiness of life. You don't, you know, I, it's impossible to be holy. It's impossible. That's the Old Testament t- told us. They couldn't do it. But there's this abundant provision of grace through faith. Faith, faith, faith. Trust, belief. 
And trust means we're willing to give up this heart idol, these things, to have the fullness of God in us. That's all it is. And it's a simple process. It's just very difficult because the flesh will cry out for these things. And that's where the suffering comes in. And he says, after the suffering of the soul, you'll see the light of life and be satisfied. Just like Jesus. That's promised for us too. So what you're saying, like, if, if you need to get a job to get a place to live, and you say, well, I've got to keep this car just right or I can't get a job, you're not going to get holy. Right. Well, I'm, I, God will take care of the car. He'll take care of the job. And what I'm saying is, God will open up jobs. God will just... It, it's amazing. If you're seeking... He says, seek my, your, my kingdom and righteousness first. Basically, the only thing you seek. That's what you seek. And all these things I'll give to you. Well, he, he, they'll, they'll, they'll fall into place. But that's what he's trying to get us back into that complete trust in him. That's where Adam and Eve fell. They went to the tree of good and evil, the tree of knowledge. That It's a pinion tree. I think this will work better. I think that'll work better. You know, they wanted to have knowledge. They wanted to be, make their own decisions. They wanted to be like God. Well, God said, I got a good, pleasing, and perfect will. You present yourself to me as a living sacrifice. That's all we have to do. And we will, he'll show us that his will is good, pleasing, and perfect because he'll begin to open it up to us and lead us. And, and the things will all fall into place. He's promised to do that. I'm not saying there won't be suffering in this world. I'm not saying that. But you, you will find that you can rejoice through it all. And the whole purpose is in the middle of suffering, the physical and temporal suffering, is to have you filled with peace and joy and this agape, selfless love that pours yourself out into other people regardless. And that's what it means to overcome the world so that the people will plainly see that what you've been doing comes from God. Only God can enable you to overcome those circumstances. And He has always manifested His glory in the truest sense when God's church was under the greatest persecution. You go back, read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read how these guys are just, you know, the things that God, I mean, the people did to these God's people. And it wasn't because God wasn't with them. God was with them. Matter of fact, He was in them so much that they were on their stake burning and they were praising the Lord. And the people saw that. And, and the conversions, because of what they were seeing in these people's lives in the, in the most severe temporal suffering because of the life that was inside of them, the conversions were tremendous. I mean, there were people drawn into Christianity rapidly in those days. Today, we're missing the life. Today, we're, we're trying to use human psychology to get us through the difficult circumstances of life and it doesn't work. And we're always burdened in bondage and people are, you know, just go to the pastor and trying to, you know, you've got to help me. Well, the pastor can't help you either. All he can do is point you to the living God who can lift you above the world, help you overcome the world. That's all we can do as a person. Teachers and pastors or anybody, we can show you the living Christ who can give you a spirit that can overcome it. There's, there's no human psychology can overcome these things. As a matter of fact, as long as you're seeking the Lord and you're trying to use these other things, God will trip you up. He'll just keep tripping you up until you have no faith in Him anymore. He's got to trip you up. He, he's got to resist that proud position that says, I can work this out in my own strength. So He can get you so humbled and so broken that He can lift you up in His strength and so we can truly live in awe of what He's done in our lives. That's where He gets all the glory. That's the only way you get it. Because otherwise we'll be trying to claim it all the time for what we're doing. Okay. Great.